Hello and welcome back for another episode. This is part two of Caesarean Section Basics, Steps of the Procedure. If you haven't already listened to part one, feel free to go back and review it. That's where I talk about all the things that need to happen to prep the patient before the incision is actually made. In today's episode, I'm going to walk through each surgical step of the cesarean delivery all the way up until the hysterotomy. And when I was an intern, and I would guess this is still common practice at many residency programs, I was actually not allowed to scrub in as primary surgeon on any surgical case unless I could verbally recite every step of the procedure to my senior and or my attending. So a good portion of my intern year was spent reading and rereading the procedure steps and op note templates to familiarize myself with these surgeries before I had the opportunity to perform them myself. And I imagine that many of you will soon be in a similar position, and this episode is meant to help you with that. Before we begin, I wanted to let you know of a free download that I'm including in the show notes. I copied my own C-section op note template into a Google Doc for you to save and review. Aside from learning procedure steps from the ACOG surgical curriculum or a textbook like Gabby's or Williams, I learned a lot by reading and rereading op note templates. And these are great because they tend to detail the procedure better when it comes to the instruments and sutures being used. And I found they helped me to visualize the procedures a bit better than when I was reading from a textbook. All right, let's dive in. The information I'm providing you with today comes from four main resources. One is the ACOG Surgical Curriculum Cesarean Delivery Module. If you haven't looked into this resource yet, I highly recommend it. I talked about it at the beginning of my last episode, but I will link to it again in the show notes for today. The second is the Gabby's Obstetrics textbook chapter on cesarean delivery. And the third and fourth resources are two journal articles. One is sort of a landmark systematic review from 2013, evaluating and suggesting evidence-based techniques that should be utilized during this procedure. And the other is a follow-up commentary that was published in 2020. So in 2013, the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology published the systematic review of 73 randomized control trials, 10 meta-analyses or systematic reviews, and 12 Cochrane reviews of studies conducted between 2005 and 2012. And with that data, provided evidence-based guidance for surgical decisions during cesarean delivery. In 2020, Obstetrics and Gynecology published a follow-up commentary after reviewing an additional 216 papers that were published between 2012 and 2019 and essentially strengthened previous standardizations while recommending some additional techniques. So if you hear me use the phrase evidence suggests or evidence supports throughout the episode, Just know that I'm referring to those last two resources, which I highly recommend reading for yourselves if and when you have time, and I will link those in the show notes. Okay, let's dive in with the actual procedure and start with the skin incision. There are four different types of skin incisions that you can choose from. The fan and steel incision, which is a slightly curved transverse incision, two to three centimeters cephalad to the pubic symphysis. There is a midline vertical incision where you incise vertically, typically starting at the same level where your fan and steel would be, so two to three centimeters cephalad to the pubic symphysis, and then carry that incision cephalad or upwards to just below the umbilicus. There is a Joel Cohen incision, which is a straight transverse incision about three centimeters caudad to the imaginary line joining the anterior superior iliac spine, and a Maillard incision, which is a curved incision made 5 to 8 centimeters cephalad to the pubic symphysis. And incisional technique can be kind of confusing. All of those four incision types that I mentioned are types of skin incisions, but they also represent different methods of dissection that occur internally as well. For example, you can make a fan and steel skin incision, but dissect the fascia and enter the peritoneum in a Joel Cohen fashion. Or you can make a Joel Cohen skin incision, but transect the rectus in a Maillard fashion. I will link to a great chart provided in the show notes from another excellent podcast, Creogs Over Coffee, their evidence-based cesarean section episode. And that breaks down all the different styles of dissection just beyond the skin incision. Factors that influence what type of incision include the urgency of the delivery, prior incision type, potential need to explore the upper abdomen for non-obstetric indications, 
and or placental disorders. So evidence supports the use of a fan and steel skin incision for routine cases, but obviously depending on the clinical scenario, you may end up proceeding with any of the previously mentioned incisions. So you've decided what type of incision you're going to make, and you can make your incision with a scalpel or a bovie on cutting current, and the length of the incision should be based on the estimated fetal size. So at term, that's going to be about 15 centimeters. As a side note, I would say that making the skin incision with a bovie is less common practice than with a scalpel. However, I obviously have limited exposure, and that will be up to whoever you are operating with. The next layer is your subcutaneous tissue, and the evidence supports sharp entry but blunt dissection. So you can transect sharply with the scalpel or bovie, and you want to stay in the midline with your incision because the more lateral you go, the more likely you are to run into these pesky perforating vessels called the superficial epigastric arteries, and those like to bleed. So sharply incise at the midline all the way down until you can just see the fascia. And then when you're at that point, you can put away your instrument and bluntly dissect all of that extra sub Q off the fascia with your fingers. Or sometimes I'll take a retractor and use that to help lateralize the sub-Q until I can see the pearly white sheen of the fascia almost all the way across. Oftentimes, if a patient has had one or more prior C-sections or laparotomies, there will be just too much scar tissue and you won't be able to bluntly dissect this layer. In those cases, sharp dissection is definitely appropriate either with the scalpel or bovie. Similar to the last step, evidence supports the use of sharp dissection or entry and blunt extension of the fascial layer. So score the two layers of fascia with your scalpel, meaning make a small transverse incision at the midline about three centimeters across or just wide enough so you and the assistant across from you can insert two fingers into the space between the fascia and rectus muscles and then stretch laterally and slightly cephalad to extend the fascial opening. And you want to make sure you're stretching in a curvilinear fashion because direct transverse extension can lead to inadvertent muscle incisions and bleeding. So pull out and up. Again, if they have a lot of scar tissue, you might not be able to bluntly extend your fascia, in which case sharp extension can be performed, either with pickups and mayo scissors or a tonsil and bovie. And you're using your pickups or tonsil to lift the fascia up off the rectus before you transect it with your scissors or bovie in that curvilinear fashion. Evidence supports the omission of superior and inferior fascial dissection off the rectus muscles, but again, depending on how scarred down they are, you may not have a choice. So to do this, you can take two coker clamps and grasp the superior fascial edge where it is attached to the rectus and lift up to the ceiling. The rectus can be bluntly dissected off the fascia by using a lap to push it down and off the fascia, or when it's particularly adherent, you can dissect it off with a scalpel or bovie. To dissect inferiorly, move your cokers to the inferior fascial edge and do the same thing. But here, we'll generally use mayo scissors instead of the bovie or scalpel for more precise dissection and to minimize the risk of injury to the underlying bladder that's just behind the rectus muscle. Once that's done, you can stretch the rectus muscles apart laterally to visualize the peritoneum. And evidence supports blunt peritoneal entry. So you're going to take your index finger and essentially poke a hole into the peritoneum, ideally as cephalad as possible to avoid injury to the bladder. And you're essentially going to poke in, sweep towards yourself, and if you haven't entered at that point, the assistant across from you is then going to take their finger and and poke right underneath your finger where the peritoneum is now thinner, and they'll sweep towards them. And you'll just keep doing this back and forth until you have entered. At that point, you can both insert your hands into the peritoneal cavity and stretch laterally against the rectus again to then be able to visualize the uterus. If it's unsafe to enter bluntly due to previous surgeries and scar tissue, the alternative method of sharp entry would involve using two Kelly clamps or tonsil clamps, anything that can just grasp gently and tent up the peritoneum holding it away from whatever lies beneath, and then transect that with Metzenbaum scissors until there is an opening wide enough for you to insert your finger and feel what's beneath. Evidence supports the omission of the bladder flap to reduce operative time as well as short and long-term bladder symptoms because it hasn't been associated with decreased rates of bladder injury. 
If it is tacked up right where you need to make your hysterotomy, though, you can use smooth forceps like Russians to pick up the bladder reflection or the vesicouterine serosa. You can incise this at the midline with mets and then tent it up while you extend the incision laterally on both sides, either bluntly with your index finger or sharply with the mets. And the goal is to make just enough room to then insert a bladder blade within that tissue plane. Okay, we are finally at the point where we can make our hysterotomy and there are five different types of uterine incisions that can be made. There is the low transverse incision, and this is the most common and preferred method because it's associated with less blood loss, it's easy to repair, and provides for the option for subsequent trial of labor after C-section because the rate of uterine rupture is lower than with incisions incorporating the upper uterine segment. Then there is a low vertical incision, which is vertical and involves mostly the lower uterine segment, but can be extended into a classical incision. The classical incision is a vertical incision that's made entirely within the upper uterine segment. Then we have the J incision, and this is made when a low transverse incision is made initially, but more room is needed. Either end of the incision is extended to the upper uterine segment and parallel to the ascending branch of the uterine artery, so in a J-appearing fashion. Alternatively, you could make a T incision, which is also an option when you've started with a low transverse incision but need more room. And here you just make an upward midline extension into the upper uterine segment. Some indications for vertical incisions include a poorly developed lower uterine segment, which often is if the gestational age is less than 25 weeks, if the fetus is back down transverse lie, if there is an anterior obstructing fibroid, a complete anterior previa, and various fetal anomalies that may necessitate more room or make it more challenging to deliver through a transverse incision in the lower uterine segment. To reduce the risk of unintended extensions of the hysterotomy, evidence supports the creation of your hysterotomy by way of making a 2 to 3 centimeter transverse incision on the uterus that doesn't actually go all the way through into the endometrial cavity because you actually want to enter that cavity bluntly with your finger. So how this looks is you would incise two to three centimeters in the lower uterine segment and your assistant would then kind of suction that area to make it easier to visualize. You can also palpate with your finger to see how much more thickness you need to make your way through with the scalpel. And you'll just keep doing that. Gentle swipe, suction, gentle swipe, suction until you feel like that area is thin enough for you to poke a hole through it with your finger. Once you've entered you'll need to extend the hysterotomy, right? Because it's only two to three centimeters across. And the evidence supports the use of blunt cephalocauda traction with your fingers, meaning pulling the incision open towards the patient's head and towards the patient's feet. The reason we don't pull laterally is because that is associated with more unintended extensions and bleeding. And the reason we don't sharply extend laterally is because that's also associated with increased bleeding and the need for blood transfusions. Once your incision has been extended, if the fetal membranes are intact, an amniotomy can be performed bluntly or with an Alice clamp, after which point your hand can be inserted through the hysterotomy to elevate the fetal head and complete the delivery. That brings us to the end of today's episode. I will see you next week for the final part of the Caesarean Basics series, where we will review fetal delivery and abdominal closure. Take care and have a great week. Again, just remember all of the references I discussed today will be listed in the link to my show notes.